Hey everyone, I'm Josh and I'm the Gatherings Director here at The River Church. And thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. And one easy way to do that is to text River Connect one word to 97,000. Or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. If you'd like to give to The River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy today's message. My wife and I, we've been married uh, coming up on three years, and so naturally, the questions have started to come, you know, when are you guys going to have kids? You know, when, when is it, right? I'm getting it. I've gotten from her mom, my parents, Pastor Roy's been on me lately. You know, people are asking us all the time, when are you going to have kids? And my response is almost uniformly the same, right? I can barely keep myself alive, let alone a child on top of it. And, and it's funny, but in reality, it's a little bit true. And this idea of fatherhood, for me, has been something that's been extremely scary. For me, I don't know why. Probably because a lot of times when I'm in ministry, I sit with so many people, and I would imagine many of you in this room have dealt with dads who weren't quite what they were supposed to be. There are plenty of people in our world, unfortunately, who have not had good fathers. Not good at all. And unfortunately, in our culture, if you are someone who has had a good father, let alone a father at all, you are the minority. And we've moved as a culture away from this traditional idea of a family that consists of a father who leads and cares for and is good and kind and loving and supportive and even bare minimum around. And so for many of us, this idea of a good father is something that is just so foreign, so out there, and so contrary to what is known. And so, for me, as I look to what may become fatherhood rather soon, is how am I going to prepare myself? What do I need to look at? How, how can I be someone who is a good father? And I loved getting a chance to read Pastor Josh's chapter in his book titled The Father. And he spends a significant amount of time diving into what a godly father should look like. And I would strongly encourage you, both guys and gals in this room, grab that book, read it. Because it is incredibly insightful and incredibly challenging. And one of the things that he talked about that really stuck out to me was that a good father gives wisdom. A good father gives wisdom. That is how a good father should interact with his family and with his kids. Before we continue tonight, I want to take a second and pray. Lord, we know you are a good father. Lord, that you love us, that you care for us, that you support us, that you guide us, and that you've given us wisdom. Wisdom through other godly individuals, and most importantly, wisdom in your word. Tonight, as we look at that wisdom, I pray that you would move and shape our hearts, and you would help us to really make a change in our lives based off of the wisdom that you offer. In your precious name, Jesus' name, amen. And so we've been going through this series of Proverbs. We started last week, and the idea is the people that we meet along the way. And so as we read through Proverbs, there are these themes, these people that we interact with, and they have something to teach us. 
And tonight, we're going to take a look at Solomon interacting with us like he is a wise and good father. And how he would teach us and interact with us. And so, jump with me to Proverbs chapter 4. He opens up this chapter with laying out who he's talking to and some of who his family is. And I think that it's significant that we take a look at it because it frames the rest of the chapter and how he wants us to understand how he is writing to us as his children. And so he says this, Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive, that you might gain wisdom. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, and live. And so he's writing this as if he's writing to his son. And I would imagine that's probably what he was doing. He was writing to his children, specifically his son that is supposed to take the throne, that is the heir. And he's saying, this is what true wisdom is. This is what true wisdom is. You may think that all this other stuff is wisdom, but true wisdom lies in these specific principles. And as you gain wisdom, you should apply these specific things to your life. And how does he do that? He says, well, these were some things that my dad taught me. These were things he received from his father. He said, when I was in the site, uh, when I was a son with my father... He taught me and said to me, let your your heart hold fast my words and keep my commandments and live. And so he's directly referencing this idea of where he came from, his lineage, his stock. And so we look back, and a lot of times we don't think that's significant. When we actually take a look, his father was King David. Many of you know King David, David and the Goliath, right? You've heard, you've heard all these stories about King David, how he is a man after God's own heart, how he is loved, how he was a great and amazing king. But we all know some things that King David did that weren't so great. He had an affair. And then when that affair got blown up, he had the woman's husband killed and then took her as his wife. Now, did you know that that is Solomon's mom? Bathsheba is Solomon's mother. And so his family tree, his lineage, is that which is filled with taboo. It's very controversial. It's not something that I would imagine the Israelites liked to talk about. Oh, where did this guy come from? You have this amazing king who's the wisest in all the land. Who are his parents? King David and Bathsheba, right? They didn't want everyone to know because it was this controversy. He came from this very intricate and interesting line. And I loved what Pastor Josh said in his book, he talked about how this is reminiscent of our family tree. And he called it the family tree of fools. And how we are born in sin, in flesh. Our lineage goes all the way back to one man, and that is Adam. And he was a poor father. He was bad. He did not do what was right. He disobeyed and, in essence, brought foolishness onto our family tree. And since that moment, we have constantly disobeyed and looked to go against God at every turn. And at every turn, we have found death. We have found separation. We have found hardship. And we have found foolishness. And so, 
we have to break out of the family tree of fools. We have to break out of the sin that we have been bound in. Now, the problem is we are what our lineage is, sinful. And there is only one way out, a new father, an adoption, a new family, a family of life, a family of restoration, a family of goodness and peace and mercy and grace. And that comes from a father, God. And there's only one way that we can be adopted into that family. It was through the death of Jesus Christ, his true son, his only begotten son. Because he came down and he sought to get rid of our sin by bearing it himself and dying on the cross and raising again to life. And so, if you want to be adopted, if you want to be a part of a family of life, if you want to be a a part of a family of truth, if you want to get out of the family of foolishness, you must be adopted. You must seek your Savior, Jesus Christ, and you must run to the Father that we are just singing about. True wisdom is gained through adoption to a heavenly family. True wisdom is gained through an adoption to a heavenly family. There was wisdom that Solomon gained from his father. But the true wisdom came when he sought his heavenly father. When he prayed, and we talked about it last week, when he sought God, when he asked him for true wisdom, it did not come from David. It did not come from Bathsheba. It came from God the Father. And so if you want wisdom, if you want something that will change your life, you have to desert the family of foolishness, and you have to run to the family of life, the family of Christ. That is the first step. And so we have this man, and we've looked at his family tree, and we know that he is the wisest man ever. And so what would the wisest man who ever lived teach his children? I know that's a question that's on my mind. If he is writing Proverbs to his children, if he is writing them thinking that they are going to come up and they are going to lead a kingdom and they are going to make decisions that impact the spiritual relationship between an entire people and a God, the creator of the universe, what would he teach them? And we see in Proverbs 4, 10 through 13, what he says. Hear, my son, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprighteousness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble. stumble. Keep hold of my instructions. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. What he's saying here is true wisdom is found in your ability to let others teach you. True wisdom is found in your ability to let others teach you. It is teachability. It is a willingness to take an honest account of what's going on in your life and say, hey, what you said makes a lot of sense. Maybe I should change a little bit. You see, so many of us are not willing to actually be taught the wisdom that we found in Scripture, the wisdom that we hear from Uh, our friends, the wisdom that we hear from our table leaders or from the pastors or from our counselors, whoever it is, we don't like to hear it. We have our own way. And we love sayings like, an old dog doesn't learn new tricks. Right? Because it's an excuse. It's an easy out. We like to say, hey, we have our rut and we stick to it. This has worked out for me in the past, even though it hasn't. And so I will continue to do what I want to do, what I think is best, what I deem 
as right in the moment. We have our way of living, and we don't want to ever admit that we are wrong. But the reality is, we were in the family of fools, and we learned all of the things that we've done from our life within foolishness. And then we like to say, well, yeah, it's, I mean, some of it is wisdom, right? Wisdom comes from experience. Wisdom comes from God, from godly experience and godly insight. I can make the same mistake a thousand times in a different way just because I have experience doesn't mean I know anything. We were in the family of fools, so why would we continue to live in foolishness rather than the wisdom that comes from Scripture, from the wisdom that comes from godly individuals who we know and who we trust and who we know have made right decisions in their lives? Solomon is addressing the folly, the falseness, the foolishness of living a life where you aren't willing to accept help, where you're not willing to accept advice, where you're not willing to accept wisdom. And he talks about it even more so in the book of Ecclesiastes. He's writing to talk about how to avoid living a worthless life, a life that means nothing, a life that is ultimately a failure. And this is what he says, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, through in his, though in his own kingdom he had been poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led, yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this is also vanity and striving after the wind. Many of us would rather be an old fat king on the throne. We would rather be towards the end and think we had all this wisdom and live out the rest of our days with as much money and a toil as we can. And it'd be easy, and us not have to heed the word of our advisors, and us to be able to continue on our own way. Sounds pretty good to me, sometimes. But in reality, what Solomon, Solomon who's been given wisdom from God, says is, it's better to be young and poor, but be willing to be teachable, than old and foolish and to sit on a throne. But we don't like to think about it that way. And especially, we don't like to think about that when it comes to the the word of God. Many of us, we like to jump around in scripture to what makes us feel good. Or what fits our narrative. We like to justify the things that we believe and what we think is right by doing quick Google searches. What does the Bible say about this? Oh, got it. We don't like to submit our entire lives to Scripture. We don't like seeing what Scripture has as a map. We always joke about the husband, right, who goes and will not be willing to ask for directions. And the only reason he's willing to ask for directions is so he can say, told you so. What should have happened and what should happen in our lives is that we go to the map first, so that we know our way before we even start out on our journey. And that's what Solomon's trying to say. Scripture, biblical advice, biblical counseling, wisdom should lead from the get-go and should be something that we are willing to learn from and not be stubborn in. I'll give you a piece of advice that my father gave me. That really shaped the way that I looked at scripture. He said, many people in our world look and say, I therefore what the Bible says. They say, I feel that this should be right. I believe this to be true. This makes sense to me. Therefore, I will justify and unjustify everything I read because it doesn't fit me. 
It starts with me. It starts with selfishness. He said, true wisdom comes when we say, the Bible, therefore, how I live. What the Bible says, who the, Bi- who the Bible tells me I should be, therefore, who I will be, how I will live. And submitting ourselves completely to Scripture. Conforming, we don't like to use that word, but we should when it comes to Scripture. We're not to conform to the world, but we are to conform to the Word of God, to biblical wisdom, to those in our lives who can speak into us and teach us wise things so that we can Run away from the sin that we like so much to be a part of. True wisdom is found in your ability to be taught. Your ability to be teachable. So then, how does this actually become a piece of who we are? Yeah, Justin, that's, that's well and good. I like to listen to TED Talks. I like to listen to podcasts. I love coming on Tuesday nights. But it's so hard to make that a reality in my life. I leave and I do the same things over and over and over again. You talk about wisdom, but how does wisdom lead me day by day? Well, Solomon's got a word for his kids on that too. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. True wisdom requires walking in wisdom purposefully. True wisdom requires walking in wisdom purposefully. Now, when I was a kid... You know, we had the old school computer, and I used to love playing this game, Minesweeper. If you've never played Minesweeper, basically what it is is you get a grid with all these blank squares. And you click on a blank square, and if you don't hit a mine, a bunch of the squares will become blank. And the object of the game is to get rid of all of the squares that don't have mines and to place a flag on all of the mines. And you can do it a bunch of different ways, primarily through numbers. It gives you numbers of how many of those squares are touching mines. Well, I, as a young kid, did not understand the concept of the game. All I knew is if you click on a square, a bunch of squares disappear, and you aren't supposed to touch a mine or you lose. And so I would spend my time playing Minesweeper by just clicking all the random boxes and hoping that I didn't hit a mine. And I became frustrated and I didn't understand why I kept losing. The reality is we live like that every single day. We do. We walk through life and we randomly click around and do random things or things that we think work or have worked in the past, when in reality, the minds are always changing. Sin is constantly finding its way to creep into your life. It will not look the same way all the time. And the reality is, you are doing so with a lack of purpose. You are randomly clicking. You are hoping things go well. When in reality, what Solomon is saying is, let this wisdom teach you where to walk. And don't take it and absorb it and not use it, but walk purposefully. Plan out your steps. Be intentional about how you start your day. Where you go, the people that you hang around with, knowing your triggers, knowing the things in your life that set you off, that push you to the liquor store or that corner or that guy who you know has that thing that you need or that website where you know you shouldn't be. And you end up on a mine and that mine explodes and it's game over and I have to start the game over again and you're frustrated. You don't understand why. And the reality is 
Your gaze is not straight before you. You are not pondering the path of your feet. You are hoping your feet don't hit a mine. What he says is, if you do ponder your feet, if you do let that wisdom impact where you walk, if you do have your, eight, your gaze set forward and away from the things of this world, your ways will be sure. And Paul addresses this same thing in Ephesians. He says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It is intentional. You cannot live frivolously and expect that things will turn towards God because they won't. You cannot live in the family tree of foolishness And hope for wisdom. You will not find it. Carefully walk. Use the wisdom that you are taught to intentionally take every step. To watch every step that you take and move so that you do not touch the landmines of sin around you. That is what true wisdom means. That is how true wisdom is made a part of your life. That is how it is taken from something that should teach us, that is being taught to us as we are teachable people and is made into something that is a consistent piece of our lives every day. And as we continue to go through Proverbs and as we continue to read a chapter of Proverbs every single day, that is the way by which it is made part of who we are. You don't make a pot unintentionally. You don't make a sculpture unintentionally. It is carefully crafted. And thus is the same with wisdom. A wise life has to be carefully, uh, carefully crafted according to the wisdom that is found in Scripture. Carefully according to the wisdom that is found from those people in your life that are holding you accountable. Through the pastors in your life, through your counselors, through your table leaders. And that is why it is important to have those people there to teach you and guide you. And it is important for you to humbly accept what they're saying and then to live purposefully out of it. And so tonight, maybe you're sitting in this room and say, yeah, maybe I am stubborn. Or maybe you sit in this room and you're too stubborn to admit that you're stubborn. I would encourage you to not live and let it consume you. If you find yourself saying and convincing yourself that an old dog doesn't uh, learn new tricks, maybe you need to turn to Scripture. Maybe you need to be diving into Proverbs. Maybe you're looking at yourself and you say, man... The people in my life, they seem to be teaching me and telling me the same thing over and over and over again. Maybe you got a problem with teachability. And I bet if you ask them, they'll tell you. Or maybe you're looking and you're saying, man, I just feel like right now in my world I'm hitting landmine after landmine and I'm getting the game over screen every single day. I would encourage you to start walking purposefully. And so tonight, if you find yourself in any of those stages, and I would encourage you, we're all at one of them. I would encourage you, come down to the front. We have table leaders who are going to be down here, or table leaders in the back. And they'll pray with you. They'll meet you where you are. They'll try and give you some godly wisdom that God has given them. And they will help you go to the Father who has The real wisdom. 
Or maybe you're sitting here and you say, man, I've been living in the family tree of foolishness too long. And that family that you talked about sounds pretty good. I'd like to be adopted. I got a father for you. And we have table leaders or I can be here and I will help you seek a God who loves you and wants you part of his heavenly family. So don't sit there and let your heart turn to stubbornness and justify a reason not to get up and come and pray because prayer is the way that we seek wisdom. Scripture is the way that we seek wisdom. Godly community is how we seek wisdom. And so do so purposely tonight. Let's pray. Lord, tonight we come to you. Lord, as we are from a family of foolishness, a, a sin that you that we have placed ourselves in. Lord, I pray that we would turn to you. Lord, I pray that if there's someone in this room who has not sought to be part of your family, who has not sought their Savior, Jesus Christ, that they would do so tonight. Lord, I pray for our hearts as we sit in this room that you would not let us be a stubborn and unteachable people. That as we turn to your word and as we turn to others, that you would let us take those things And live according to the wisdom that you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do it every single day. Lord, that we would not fall prey to weakness. We would not fall prey to trying to do it on our own strength. Lord, that we would seek you and the purpose you give us. That we would seek you and the wisdom you give in scripture. And that we would live intentionally in the wisdom by which you give us. Lord, we love you in your precious and holy name. In Jesus' name, amen.